Hi, I'm Jill Heinerth. Let's have a look at how your dive computer calculates ascent and or decompression stops. I'm Jill Heinerth, tech diver, instructor, and underwater explorer. I'm trying to clear up some misconceptions about basic dive physics and physiology. This is the second installment in a three-part series that will inform you about how your computer works and how you can plan safe dives. For me, diving computers offer the technological support for dives that push the bounds of human potential. But you need to understand how they work, too. Let's review a bit. As discussed in the previous video, when a diver descends, their tissues store inert gas, which has to be effectively released on ascent. The human body needs to reacclimate to surface pressure. It doesn't magically happen at the moment we hit the surface of the water. It occurs through a thoughtful, slow ascent based on mathematical predictions about how the body reacts to a reduction in pressure. Off-gassing continues well after the dive until we reach equilibrium with surface pressure. The point of saturation of most significant interest to researchers and mathematicians is a point called critical supersaturation. When a particular tissue grouping, known as a compartment, reaches the point where it's technically overpressurized or oversaturated, it has reached the point where no gas can be dissolved into the tissues. It's full it can no longer hold additional inert gas. This critical moment of reaching maximum pressure is known as the M value or maximum value. Given that we have many different types of tissues, tissue compartments, we have numerous M values to consider when building a decompression algorithm or mathematical model to predict how the human body will off-gas when ascending. For recreational divers, most of the focus is on fast tissue compartments. Time and depth limits are made to keep the diver in a safe envelope for direct ascent. The safety stop provides additional safety. Tech divers that stay down longer and go deeper load fast and slower tissues. And that's where things get more complicated for the mathematician. Today, most recreational and technical divers use computers to calculate multi-level profiles. That means that companies such as Sunto must be dedicated to providing instrumentation, but also employ researchers and engineers to qualify, test, and continuously improve their algorithms. As diving practices change over time, their work reflects new trends and activities, including mixed gases, rebreathers, surface intervals, longer dive times, and more extreme environmental factors. Technical divers such as myself make long and deep dives into challenging environments. However, we also make short recreational dives and lots of excursions that straddle what we define as rec and tech. As more real diving data is collected, researchers can look at real profiles and continue to improve logical models reflective of the type of diving that we do. People assume that all algorithms work the same or are equal, but that's not really true. There's no governing body that regulates computers and the algorithms that manufacturers use. Scuba regulators and other equipment are subjected to testing standards, but computers and the mathematical models that are at their heart are not governed in any way. I've been diving Cento computers for, gosh, 
over 20 years. And part of the reason for that is because I've seen their rigorous testing regimens. I've seen the manufacturing standards, as well as their active algorithm research and development. I've been to the factory, seen their testing, and I know I can rely on their commitment to excellence. Okay, personal opinions aside, let's get back to how these things work. Decompression models use up to 16 different theoretical tissue compartments. During the ascent, the computer's algorithm considers both fast and slow tissues and their different maximum values, their M values. Traditionally, this was accommodated with a series of stepped pauses in ascent to allow a particular tissue group to drop below its M value by a certain amount before ascending further. The profile looked like a series of stairs with progressively longer and longer steps nearer to the surface. A decompression stop was performed until it was safe to move up to another theoretical limit. More stops were added to accommodate additional M values until reaching the surface. The deeper stops tended to be shorter than shallower stops that allowed for tissues to release their inert gas loads, the slower tissues. Of course, we can't forget that the deeper stops might also incur penalties. Some tissues can take on inert gas while others are releasing it. Sound complicated? Well, it turns out that the step profile might also not be the best way to ease inert gas out of the human body. Rather than steps, it seems more prudent to ease off the accelerator rather than slam on the brakes. A slow, continuous ascent from depth, so technical and deep divers have a shorter total decompression time, might actually be better for the body too. Staying in the zone of a deco window rather than hanging motionless, staged in stepped advances, also makes intuitive sense. And how about multiple dives in one day or repetitious ascents during training dives? Those need to be factored into the math as well. What's even more complicated is that the presence of bubbles or micro bubbles does not always mean an increased risk for the bends. We know that micro bubbles in the capillaries around the lungs alveoli can obstruct the blood flow and delay off gassing. Those same bubble invaders can completely block blood flow to nerves or other tissues, resulting in damage or cell death. But we still can't quantify the effects of long-term diving or frequent subclinical hits over a career of diving. Do you go home exhausted after a day of diving? Is that the result of subsymptomatic bubbles? Will that affect your body over time? We don't know. With more than 7,500 dives under my belt, these things concern me. I want to be safe each time I go diving, but I want to be doubly sure that I'm not doing long-term damage that might not appear right away. Mixed diving profiles, varied fitness, and diverse environmental conditions in a relatively young sport means messy, inconclusive data. It's a lot for researchers to digest and difficult for them to distill that data into neat little packages. For that reason, mathematical algorithms have to be sufficiently conservative to accommodate a lot of different diving practices and people. For example, the original Navy Air dive tables that we used before computers were designed for fit, young, military male divers making a single dive in a day. Researchers even allowed for an acceptable hit rate for these subjects. It was thought to be acceptable to bend a certain number of soldiers. When I was a young diver, we used these Navy diving tables and even tried to extrapolate their limits in ways for which they were never intended. Fortunately, today we have much better options for improving safety margins. Conservatism settings and gradient factors help divers make choices that better fit their personal circumstances. I'll dive into that in the next video segment, segment three. Join me again.
I'd like to thank Sunto for supporting this educational video series.